Great. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I must say, it's, uh, my, well, it's not my first time in San Diego. It's my first time in the Salk, uh, Salk Institute. And this building is absolutely amazing. And uh, I must say, uh, having seen a lot of pictures um, of the Louis Kahn building before, just being here, uh, it's magical. And looking out onto the ocean this morning was gorgeous through the uh, architecture. Um, I'm going to offer you here a little bit of a, a clinical perspective upon um, hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy and talk about the uh, disorder of uh, cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy um, and, and uh, hopefully show you how uh, bringing clinical context and unmet need to uh, the power of Mendelian uh, disease biology really helps accelerate things. Uh, here are my disclosures. Um, so briefly about cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy, this is a single gene disorder um, that uh, causes devastating uh, neurological disease. Uh, it typically affects boys between the ages of 4 and 10. Uh, they uh, develop hyperactivity, personality changes, um, often they're put on Ritalin, uh, and then within months they start having gait difficulties, vision problems, uh, start bumping into walls. And they lose the ability to walk and talk. And, uh, and this young boy, was, uh, shown here, was the first boy who I um, treated at, uh, during my residency. Ten months after onset of his symptoms, he succumbed to an aspiration pneumonia and, and died. So what does this uh, um, uh, mutated gene do? The gene encodes a peroxisomal half-transporter called ABCD1. Uh, it uh, sits in the peroxisomal uh, membrane and is responsible for importing uh, acylated very long-chain fatty acids. If you have a defect in this protein, you have accumulation uh, and upregulation of uh, very long-chain fatty acids. Uh, but uh, despite us knowing of now uh, more than 1,000 different mutations, uh, there's no genotype-phenotype correlation or a correlation between the levels of plasma very long-chain fatty acids and uh, the severity of the disease. Um, what you do see on uh, MR imaging is this devastating picture of demyelination with contrast enhancement uh, showing the progression and in active inflammation in the brain. Here, a young boy who I, uh, saw me half a year ago who was really quite precocious up to about half a year before he saw me here attending karate class, uh, highly verbal. And then um, after onset of symptoms, within three months, this is the picture that I saw. A boy who was really suffering from uh, gait ataxia, vision problems, um, could hardly walk, um, and is now currently in a vegetative state, um, cannot walk or talk. So. Uh, not a disease of developmental delay. This is a disease, really, that strikes boys who are developing uh, well, and then is really a disorder of regression, where you see this um, really striking in a really fatal way. So how can you uh, measure neurologic progression in a disorder like this that affects multiple different domains, from speech to motor um, and other aspects? What we use is a neurological function score that um, cuts across all these different neurological domains. And uh, it's a 25-point score that we use. And the major functional disabilities are here shown in bold, which we uh, focused upon, and really are loss of communication, cortical blindness, tube feeding, and others that are uh, essential to um, uh, everyday life. In addition, we had the advantage that we could use MR imaging, which shows a very systematic picture of progression um, that we measure with a an MRI severity score called the less MRI severity score. And it accounts for the uh, degree and extent of the white matter lesions, as shown here in, in examples um, in the bottom left, 
So you can see that you have an early lesion where the less score is one, and as the uh, lesion progresses through the white matter into the periventricular and central white matter, you have a higher score, score of 15. And as I said before, the pathological hallmark of this disorder is that of active inflammation with contrast enhancement showing that there is a breakdown of blood-brain barrier. And it is really this target that we aim to uh, go after with our gene therapy treatment. So what leads to this blood-brain barrier? Uh, disruption in cerebral ALD. Just uh, briefly to touch upon this because this is such a distinct um, a picture in, uh, in adrenal leukodystrophy. And here, a very uh, talented young faculty looked at this, uh, Patricia Mussolino, and she found that even beyond the areas that were demyelinated and areas where myelin was still pr preserved, she found uh, MMP9 and fibrinogen uh, leakage showing that there was already some early uh, disruption of the blood-brain barrier occurring. And she modeled this nicely in human brain microvascular endothelial cells using siRNA to knock down ABCD1. And what she was able to show is that uh, this knockdown led to a decrease messenger RNA and protein level of tight junction proteins such as Claudin-5 and upregulation of adhesion molecules such as ICAM-1. And you can see here an example of what this does in, in uh, endothelial cell culture where the normal expression of Claudin-5 here, the membrane of the endothelial cells, is not found after ABCD1 downregulation. So what we think here, to make a long story short, is happening, usually where ABCD1 is present, these tight junctions are preserved. Once you have a mutated ABCD1, this becomes fragile. How does that happen? You have upregulation of adhesion molecules binding, and uh, these, uh, so there's a more adhesion of monocytes, leukocytes, the uh, cl normal Claudian 5 expression doesn't occur, and this membrane now becomes permeable. And in very nice functional studies, she was able to show that both adhesion and, um, um, and the permeability increased in, in, uh, after siRNA knockdown of ABCD1. So coming back down to the, back to the clinical uh, disease uh, setting, what can we do to uh, stop this relentless progression of, uh, of this demyelinating inflammatory disease. Well, it turns out that for 10, 20 years, we've been using allogeneic bone marrow transplantation to treat this disorder. Um, and if you do this in the early stages of cerebral ALD, when the boys still have an early lesion and you use a well-matched donor, you can actually dramatically impact uh, their uh, survival. And you, what you see here in red is the survival curves in the untreated condition um, 54% at five years, compared to the early allogeneic bone marrow transplantation, 95%. Why does this happen? Some of this was already alluded to uh, by Stephanie and others. Um, we think that what's happening is uh, a, a correction of the microglial cell population. Why do we think that? Well, we've looked at the brain pathology in, in cerebral ALD, and what we've found is that there is a, a rim a whole zone of microglial cell death occurring around the uh, inflammatory lesion in areas where myelin is still preserved. And this uh, zone of microglial cell death is, I think, what is being impacted by uh, the bone marrow transplantation. So we think bone marrow-derived monocytes enter the CNS, differentiate into microglia-like cells expressing normal ALD protein. So while Allogeneic bone marrow transplantation is effective in patients with early cerebral ALD. It comes with significant um, risks. There's uh, more than 10% treatment-related mortality. Historically, there was as high as a 40-50% uh, chance of developing graft-versus-host. These numbers have gotten better, but there's still a significant risk of developing both acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease, and sadly, um, about more than half of the boys <laughs> are transplanted with a mismatched, unrelated donor, putting them at the risk of these side effects. So in 2009, a really critical proof of concept study uh, was performed by Nathalie Cati and Patrick Abour. Um, and they had a, a scenario that they saw two boys in Paris that had come to them from Spain who didn't have a, an HLA-matched uh, donor. And what they decided to do is take the boys' own bone marrow cells and in a dish correct them, these cells, with a lentiviral vector delivering a healthy copy of ABCD1. 
And what they found was that 14 to 16 months after uh, doing that, these boys stabilized in terms of their neurodegeneration. So what we decided to do is build on this and use a similar self-inactivating lentiviral vector delivering a functional copy of ABCD1 to autologous uh, hematopoietic stem cells. And I'm going to briefly here report uh, the results of this open-label single-arm phase 2-3 study of Lenti D in cerebral ALD. Enrollment criteria, importantly, are really identical to what we do with conventional bone marrow transplantation. These are boys that have um, evidence of active cerebral ALD. Uh, they have to have a lesion um, in uh, their brain that shows contrast enhancement, showing that they're in the active uh, inflammatory uh, phase of the disease. Importantly, we excluded those boys who had a matched sibling donor for bone marrow transplantation because we thought those boys would actually do better with a conventional uh, bone marrow transplantation. We looked at major functional disabilities, the scoring system I mentioned before uh, on imaging, and importantly, osat gadolinium enhancement uh, resolution over time. Importantly, because this was really a first uh, trial of ex vivo lentiviral gene therapy in this disorder, we were very interested in uh, keeping uh, track of any insertional mutagenesis. Um, so we reported this in the New England Journal last year, but just to say how we uh, performed um, this ex vivo gene therapy, um, we saw the boys, we um, used GCSF to mobilize their uh, bone marrow cells into the periphery. We selected the CD34 cells after harvesting these cells, transduced them with a lenti uh, D vector, delivering a healthy copy of ABCD1, and then we uh, delivered these cells back to the boys after a brief amount of myeloblation with bucelfen and cyclophosphamide, and then we followed them for a two-year period. Importantly, nothing about what I just said is different from what you would do under an allogeneic bone marrow transplantation, with the exception that these are autologous cells, so cells from the boys themselves. So how many boys did we enroll? In the first phase of the uh, uh, trial that we reported out, uh, we enrolled 18. One boy was already uh, uh, ineligible at time of screening. So we treated 17, 11 of them in Boston. Um, data as of August 2017, was, uh, there's been a total of tw 21 patients, and we've actually treated now more than 30 patients worldwide. The baseline characteristics of these boys is that uh, they all have an, an early lesion with a uh, median baseline less score of two um, on, on their median um, NFS score was zero. So these are really early pre-symptomatic or early symptomatic boys that have first lesion, uh, trying to really catch them at this inflection point. So how did the boys do, and did this therapy work? Um, we found that 16 of the 17 boys had a stable neurologic function score and remained free of major functional disabilities. There was one boy who was really progressing already quite rapidly at the time of enrollment and then succumbed to disease progression um, and, and, and died, so we couldn't rescue him. There was another boy who uh, did not develop new symptoms but had some contrast enhancement emerge on MRI he went for a separate uh, bone marrow transplantation and sadly succumbed to that second transplant. However, I will point out that we think that this is dramatically different than what you, you would see in the untreated natural history of this disorder where usually the neurologic function scores rapidly arise over time. We do think it is similar to what you would see under a conventional bone marrow transplantation where, again, most of the boys if treated early um, um, can stabilize. What happens on MR imaging? Um, just to show you an example of a, a typical case, you have a lesion within the splenium of the corpus callosum that usually uh, stabilizes after one year and two years of treatment. You see hardly any extension. This is quite different from what you see in the untreated case that spreads out into the central and subcortical white matter. Early on, you see um, um, at screening this contrast enhancement that was an important inclusion criteria that uh, diminishes at one year, two years. Again, very different from what you see uh, with this garland of contrast enhancement in the untreated case. 
Is this representative for the larger cohort? And yes, it is. The half of the patients stabilize in their LESS scores immediately. The other half uh, takes about 12 months for their imaging progression to stabilize over time. Again, a picture that is similar to what you see with conventional bone marrow transplantation. So in the majority of the boys, uh, the gadolinium enhancement resolved uh, in 11 of 15 patients by 24 months. Um, what you're seeing here in orange is the uh, time points where they had contrast enhancement compared to green uh, uh, dots where it resolved. Some of the boys had this uh, uh, re-emergence of contrast enhancement over time, but it usually went away when, uh, on re-imaging. And I want to point out that actually the contrast enhancement at screening is very different from what we see at re-emergence. So usually there's a very discrete um, um, uh, contrast enhancement seen at screening, and at uh, 12 months, uh, when it reemerges in those cases, it's very faint and diffuse. So we think we're dealing here with really a different scenario. So did we get the gene in, and was ALD protein expressed? Uh, yes, you see vector copy number expressed until the very last uh, follow-up uh, time points, and um, ALD protein was found in up to, uh, on average, 20% of CD14 positive cells, uh, showing us that we got functional protein into um, um, the boys. Important determinants, I think, for success was that we had a, a high vector copy number in the boys and that they were treated in the early stages of the disease, and this just summarizes this briefly. What kinds of adverse events did we see? We saw no graft failure, uh, graft versus host disease. Uh, importantly, uh, there was uh, uh, polyclonality was maintained throughout uh, the, the trial, and the adverse events that we did see were related to conventional uh, myeloablation seen in a normal transplant setting. So just to summarize here, uh, briefly, of the 17 patients who completed 24 follow months follow-up all remain alive and free of major functional disability. No graft versus host or graft uh, failure reported. Um, and um, uh, Lenti D may be an important alternative, particularly for those boys who are lacking a sibling donor um, and really might have poor outcome uh, without that matched sibling donor. Um, so, you know, the disease uh, really, I think, with this trial has, has reached a, a milestone. Uh, it's been 100 years since the first description of cerebral ALD, and to know that many of these boys are, now have some uh, successful uh, treatment uh, was, was um, important in my career. Ten years ago when I started my clinic, most of the boys were coming in in wheelchairs at death's door and really to see them now come back and report back from soccer camp and, and have a full filled life is, is um, an amazing experience. So um, we hope to continue this path. Just briefly to cut upon some, touch upon something that the biological premise of this uh, uh, and something that Stephanie also mentioned, we think that turnover of brain microglia from bone marrow to myel, uh, monocytic cells is critical here. Um, you know, in embryonic stages, this happens from yolk sac, but when we know that with neurodegeneration, there can be turnover from uh, this uh, compartment, and it was actually very important to me to recognize the clinical scenario and opportunity in bringing this biological premise to bear upon uh, this devastating disease and recognizing the clinical risks of conventional transplantation really enabled this small step but important step towards ex vivo gene therapy for this disorder. Um, we really had very little preclinical data. We did not have even an animal model of the disease. And I will tell you that was a tremendous advantage in moving forward fast. <laughs> because if we had had an animal model of the disease, we would have been asked to do all kinds of things that may or may not have been relevant to us moving fast into clinic. The only data that really was there was the fact that we could repopulate brain microglia from ALD mice um, by lentiviral transduced uh, bone marrow cells. But because these mice never developed inflammatory disease of the brain, there was really nothing more to, to do there. And so this was done in nod skid mice as well as in, in, um, in the ABCD1 knockout mouse as proof of concept, and then we moved on. So I think the um, most important impasse for me was to convince my neurological colleagues 
that there was an important crosstalk happening between the hematopoietic compartment and the brain. And this collaboration across organ systems uh, with David Williams at, at Boston Children's, a fantastic uh, hematologist and gene therapy uh, expert, uh, was, was tantamount uh, to moving things forward. So defining target cells and structures and aligning preclinical and clinical expertise is key. We try within the Center for Rare Neurological Diseases to really uh, be this bridge uh, between a lot of the gene discoveries happening at the Broad, a lot of the clinical trials happening at the Neurological Clinical Research Institute, and saying there is really some tremendous biology uh, in rare diseases that can be leveraged to rapid translation and acceleration of clinical trials. And not one size fits all. You have to understand the landscape of each individual disease and address the gaps. In some diseases, you might have iPSC cells, you might have a compound available, but you're missing a biomarker or have no natural history. In another disease, you might have an existing animal model, uh, but you have no outcome measures, you have no industry partner, and you have to go after the gap. You cannot simply dwell upon what you already have. And I think doing that with patient perspective in mind can really help accelerate things um, and, and bring these uh, transformative uh, technologies to bear. So in conclusion, we've had reassuring safety and efficacy uh, 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 data for the first uh, gene therapy trial in cerebral ALD. Um, as I said, we did this without an animal model of the disease. And uh, the risks of, of current practice really informed the window of intervention and route of administration. I think that's sort of an important message I wanted to um, pass on. Clearly, a lot of people contributed to this. It needed a village. Um, and I want to really thank David Williams and Christy Duncan, who are terrific collaborators, um, a whole team and host of people, um, the, the sponsor who was um, uh, uh, tremendous, and really to acknowledge a lot of the uh, brave families and, and patients that went through this. Here are three boys who went through the trial um, whose in, init, uh, initials happened to start with a, D, and L, and they celebrated a birthday to the, together. And so what they wrote on their birthday cake was A, L, D, and they crossed it out and put their initials A, D, and L to show that we, they were really empowered um, and had felt like they had conquered this disease. So thank you. I think there's time for questions. Any question? So you, you were talking about your adverse event, and you know you said that it was mostly due to busulfan. Um, can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, so the uh, the the adverse events that we saw were really uh, transient infections, tachycardia, cystitis that occurred. Um, so things that you would expect with normal immune suppression and things that our, our colleagues who, on the hematology and transplant wards are very familiar with. Um, so I think uh, on that end, we feel very comfortable. There are, there are still you know, concerns over some of this reemergence of contrast enhancement and fully understanding that. And I think it's really an opportunity to do some reverse translational work and really understand uh, what is the threshold of health and disease in some of these cells. And, and the patients who were transplanted in 2013, uh, do they still show a stable uh, vector copy number? Y yes, no? yes. So, so I, I showed that in that yeah. one slide. We, got, uh, we have 20% of peripheral blood monocytes stably expressed in, in peripheral blood um, at last follow-up. One last question. Very nice, very nice work. Um, just a, one thought for consideration in terms of... Um, Time is of the essence to treat these children when you see the onset. And <clears throat> if you could develop a, a safer allogeneic off-the-shelf product that's already pre-engineered or you have the HLA typing done, it could be viable. The graft versus host issue, both from this talk and the previous talk, are something significant. One might consider using cord blood hematopoietic stem cells in lieu of standard matched unrelated because the risk of GVHD is far, far lower they're much more tolerogenic. Uh, the question I have for you, though, is 
and it doesn't matter. The stuff works, so who cares? But nonetheless, did you see an effect on blood-brain barrier function and ICAM-1 downregulation? Uh, yeah, so hard to measure in vivo, right? Um, so, is, but the, with the tools that we have, which is uh, perfusion, uh, uh, brain MRI, uh, we're looking at that uh, uh, in, uh, in more detail and quantifying that. But certainly the contrast enhancement that we uh, initially see diminishes. So we do think that there is some uh, repair that is occurring of the blood-brain barrier. What, what exactly is contributing to that and what kinds of cells are corrected is a little beyond the scope.